Welcome back to my Psychology of Villainy series. I am extremely flattered by the response to the first entry in the series, Lex Luthor, and hope you will enjoy this new video essay. Keep in mind I am not a trained psychologist, but merely a writer using clinical behavior to better define fictional characters. This is in no way meant to be presented as an actual treatment or diagnosis of symptoms, and is for the purpose of being of better understanding popular characters and for improved storytelling only. Batman is arguably one of the most popular characters in the world, and with him comes a collection of colorful villains that the average person would be able to recognize even if they've never read a comic. Penguin, Joker, Mr. Freeze, and Harley Quinn have become almost household names, and when you're looking at why these villains work so well, you will see that they are often a mirror image of a certain aspect of Batman's own personality, ability, or history. They connect to the hero in a personal way, and today's entry is no different. The Dark Knight is often called the world's greatest detective. Very few of Batman's villains are a match for him in that department. None more so than Edward Nigma, the Riddler. While many villains tend to be narcissists or megalomaniacs, I don't see the Riddler that way. Nor do I think his compulsive compulsion for leaving clues comes from OCD. I think Nigma has obsessive compulsive personality disorder and bipolar one, which will become clear when we look at the character's history in both comics and on television. He first appeared in 1948, a creation of Bill Finger and Dick Sprang, showing up in a 12-page story in Detective Comics number 140. He was billed as a sensational new adversary and as the Prince of Puzzles, rather grandiose terms for a character who would appear once more then vanish from comics for 17 years. We get to see his simple and mundane origins as the young and aptly named Edward Nigma, who decided to cheat on a jigsaw puzzle contest by breaking into his teacher's desk and getting the solution. He fell in love with puzzles, becoming known as an expert, and as he got older, he used puzzles to swindle people out of money. Looking for bigger challenges, he set his sights first on the Gotham Police, and eventually the Cape Crusader. After a series of puzzle-themed crimes, and an attempt to capture the dynamic duo in the Death Trap, he would eventually end up in prison, an almost two-decade hiatus from comics pages. Why writer Gardner Fox suddenly decided to use the character after such a long time away is unknown, but his appearance in Batman number 170 in 1965 changed everything for the character. Nigma gets out of prison and approaches Batman, claiming to be reformed, and offers to help him catch a group called the Molehill Gang, which he does. But he then uses clues to try and discredit the hero making it appear like Batman's harassing the Riddler. Eventually, Batman figures out the true crime, and Nigma ends up back in prison. And while it did first introduce the idea of the Riddler helping Batman, which would happen a few times in the future, the real important part of the comic was whose hands it ended up in. Those hands being that of William Dozier, the man who created the Batman television series. The issue was one of a handful of books an assistant picked up for him, and the Riddler particularly caught his eye enough that he was made the villain for the pilot episode, High Diddle Riddle, which was loosely based on the comic. Frank Gorshin's portrayal of the puzzle-loving rogue skyrocketed Enigma's popularity among fans, and the villain would appear seven different comic times over the next two years. With so little comic material to work from, Gorshin's take on the Riddler was quite interesting and in a way character-defining. Even in his first appearance, the villain was constantly at a high energy level, with an over-the-top laugh and a quick wit. But Gorshin had another layer, a dangerous look in his eyes that showed he was more than just fun and games. 
he would go from calm and calculating to completely unstable at the drop of a hat. This manic personality would become the norm for the character in a lot of the writings. Not the first time that portrayal of a character in other media would then influence the comic take. But comics weren't done defining the characterizer, either. Gardner Fox told a story in Batman number 179 in the same month the television series debuted, January 1966, that was just as important. The Riddler escapes from prison and realizes the clues he leaves are why he keeps getting caught. He decides to commit a crime without them, but he finds it difficult to do so and must literally force himself to finish the crime. We later learn that he still subconsciously left clues behind. While not as overt as his normal messages, Batman is still able to piece them together to recapture Nigma. This was the first time that his riddles were portrayed as anything more than a gimmick. His mind actively fought against him committing crimes without the riddles, inhibiting his own success. This is a rather sophisticated writing for that era of comics, and it might not have been allowed just a few months later when the campiness of the television series was fully embraced by the comics. The next big defining moment for the character would come as co-creator of Batman the Animated Series, Paul Dini, took over writing Detective Comics in October of 2006. In issue number 822, a reformed Edward Nigma becomes a detective and is hired to solve the murder of a young socialite. The idea of Nigma turning his intelligence towards good was teased over the years, but this was the first time it was played out as a legit character development. In a three-issue Batman Confidential run in 2009 by Nunzio De Filippis and Christina Weir, the character was shown to be a bit more intelligent and slightly better detective than Batman. While eventually reverting to crime, these stories showed the character's true potential if he could get his issues under control. While the linear look at the evolution of the character is simplified, the way he has been handled over the years in both comics and other media has varied greatly. I believe this comes from both misdiagnosing his obsession with riddles and missing the underlining comorbidity. You can find dozens of videos and essays online that define the character as having obsessive compulsive disorder due to his inability to do crimes without leaving clues. This is a wrong interpretation of what Gardner Fox presented to us all those years ago. Obsessive-compulsive disorder is characterized by unreasonable thoughts and fears, basically obsessions, that lead to compulsive behavior. These fears are usually focused on germs or safety, and that leads to cleaning rituals or having to check and recheck things that might be dangerous, like a, a stove or an iron. And while Nigma is obsessed with his riddles and puzzles, I don't see the motivation for that obsession being based on his thoughts or fears. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder is often confused with OCD, but other than the similar name, they are quite different in causation and reaction. Where in OCD the compulsive behavior is, in theory, supposed to alleviate the anxiety created by the obsessive thoughts. OCPD is a disorder that has a pervasive pattern of maladaptive personality traits. OCPD exists in anywhere from 2 to 8% of the population, which makes it one of the most prevalent personality disorders in society. It's, it's characterized by perfectionism, moral rigidity, negative affectation, interpersonal aggression, and a need to control other people. For an OCPD diagnosis, there needs to be four of eight possible criteria. A preoccupation with details, order, and rules. Perfectionism that interferes with being able to complete a task. An excessive devotion to productivity. A tendency to be inflexible about matters of morality, ethics, or values. Hoarding. 
incapable of delegating tasks, a miserly spending style, and an overall rigidity and stubbornness. The two traits most common in an OCPD patient are perfectionism and rigidity. There are also two subtypes, aggressive and pleasing. In this case, I think Nigma falls into the aggressive category, where the person is vindictive, self-centered, with hostile and dominant behavior. They engage in frequent arguments with other people and tend to anger easily. The causation of this disorder is still mostly unclear, but a strict upbringing often is a factor. As a boy, Nigma was overlooked and ignored. In some versions, his father was jealous of Edward's intelligence, accusing him of cheating and beating him. The first opportunity for Nigma to get any positive attention came with the puzzle contest, and while he cheated to win, he was rewarded with the attention he craved. This created a pattern that he would go on to repeat and escalate throughout his life. It wasn't necessarily the money he was after, it was the adulation of outsmarting someone and getting away with it. This pattern became a rule of sorts that he would follow and would continue to succeed until he crossed paths with Batman. And while his early encounters landed him in prison, his later failures would lead him to Arkham Asylum as his actions became more clearly a psychological disorder. His OCPD kept him repeating his patterns even when he became aware of their detrimental nature. His desire to make the perfect crime or the perfect riddle often stops him from succeeding. Another odd aspect of the character that comes up sometimes in comics is his inability to lie. Part of why he got into asking riddles was a way to answer without answering. The inability to lie fits into the inflexibility when it comes to moral and ethics as part of the OCPD diagnosis. We all define our own morals and ethics. Nigma has his, and while questionable to some, he sticks to them at all costs. OCPD often presents with a comorbidity. The existence of more than one di disorder in an individual, and while it covers the characteristics we see in Nigma in the comics, the way Frank Gorshin portrayed the character seems to fit a second disorder, bipolar 1. Bipolar disorder is a condition where a person's mood cycles from extreme highs to extreme lows. It can be, it can affect energy levels, inability to function, and can even cause hallucinations and delusions. The difference between the two types of bipolar has to do with the severity of the mood swings, with bipolar one being the more extreme. Bipolar is, is diagnosed with the following criteria a persistent period of elevated or irritable mood, along with an increase in goal-directed activity or energy. The second criteria is a group of seven traits that would appear to be elevated. Those include high levels of self-esteem, almost to the point of delusions of grandeur, decreased need for sleep, far more talkative, racing thoughts or ideas, distractibility, increased goal-directed activity, and increased involvement in dangerous activity. For it to count as a manic episode, it can't be caused by a medical condition or substances, and it must show a marked impairment. Now let's look at Edward Nigma here. Most of the time, we see him in the middle of a crime where he feels invincible, like he's smarter than everyone else. He's very talkative, extremely energetic, and focused on his task, and while he could simply go to another city, he stays in Gotham to take on Batman, increasing the chances he's going to get caught. We don't often see him outside of a caper, and when we do, he's labeled cured or working as a and working as a detective. These times he's likely medicated or doing therapy, and the manic and depressive states are leveled out allowing him to function in a more controlled way, and even his OCPD is easier to manage. 
The comorbidity diagnosis makes the most sense for what has presented early on for the character and most of what we've seen of him through the years. I believe the Riddler was created as a blank slate, and it was the work of Gardner Fox and Frank Gorshin that truly gave the character any depth. Gorshin's portrayal has had the most long-lasting effect, not only the Riddler's personality, but it was Gorshin who came up with the Riddle Me This line and requested the question mark suit and bowler hat as an alternative to the one-piece jumpsuit he first wore. Had Gorshin not made the character so memorable on the series, there's a better than average chance he would have faded away having only appeared three times in comics. And as Gorshin only had those three comics to work with for the character, Gardner Fox's interpretation in the riddleless robberies of the Riddler obviously played a big part in his research. There was some tension between Gorshin and the producers on the Batman series, and when the actor wasn't available during season two, John Aston from the Adams Family was brought in to play the part. While Aston is a terrific actor, his performance fell a bit flat compared to the manic energy Gorshin brought. The producers were able to talk Gorshin into returning for the third season, and he would play the role again in The Legends of the Superheroes in 1979. While there wouldn't be another live-action Riddler for 15 years, the popularity of the character made him a regular in animated features, starting with the Filmation Batman series in 1968, where he was voiced by comedic actor Ted Knight. He would show up in many other series of the years, usually mimicking Gorshin's take on the character. That would change with Batman the Animated Series. The producers wanted to go a different direction with the Riddler, making him more sedate, less wild clothing, and less manic so he'd stand out from the Joker. They hired actor John Glover to voice the character, and he gave us a smooth intellectual with genuinely challenging puzzles. They tweaked his origin to make him a bit more sympathetic. Part of his origin was now as a game programmer, which brought a tech aspect to the character that hadn't been there before. This was a version you believed was on an intellectual level with Batman and could push the Dark Knight in new ways. The Riddler would return to live action in 1995 film Batman Forever, where he was played by Jim Carrey. They combined a bit of the new origin given to him in the animated series with the over-the-top performance from the late 60s to create a scene-stealing character that often played off of Tommy Lee Jones's Two-Face. Carrey's, Carrey's Nigma seemed to take what Gorshin did and turn it up to 11. But we really never got to see the character's true intellect. He lacked any real depth, and it felt like they just pointed the camera at him and said, be Jim Carrey. Around the same time in the comics, writer Chuck Dixon revamped Nigma's backstory in Detective Comics Annual number eight, where the idea that Nigma's eccentric criminal behavior came from an obsessive desire to prove that he matters. This would fit in with the bipolar diagnosis during the depression cycles, and that when he does swing back up and plans a job, his OCPD forces him to stick to the rules he's created for himself. Another major comic story in the early, another major comic story in the early 2000s that featured Nigma was Batman Hush. This pitted the Crape Crusader against a new villain who knew his identity as well as other members of the rogues gallery, all of whom are either enhanced or acting out of character. It turns out that the Riddler is the mastermind behind everything, a plan he put together after he deduced that Batman was Bruce Wayne. This showed just how dangerous the mastermind version of Nigma could be. With the launch of the 2014 television series Gotham, we got our deepest dive into the character of Edward Nigma. Played by actor Corey Michael Smith, we watched as he went from being the crime scene tech with poor social skills and a love of giving information in the form of a riddle, to him following his heart and becoming a murderer because of it. When he was struggling the most with his identity, 
He would at times hallucinate and see a version of himself in the mirror that was more confident and malicious, a representation of what the Riddler could be if let loose. These would coincide with the depression episode. We also got to see the growth of a complicated love-hate relationship with Oswald Cobblepot, played by Robin Lord Taylor. Over the course of the series, the character grew from awkward lab rat to a cross between John Glover's animated version and Frank Gorshin's live action. Never quite as cool as Glover, nor as high strung as Gorshin, the character found a believable middle road that kept the quirks and disorders we'd come to expect. There are other versions of the character, some of them taken in very different directions, but the one that might seem to be the most different hasn't come out yet. Matt Reeves is currently filming The Batman with Robert Pattinson as a young Dark Knight. The main villain appears to be more extreme version of the Riddler, played by Paul Dano. The first change we see is that he's going by Edward Nashton here, the other surname the character has had in the comics over the years. But from what we've seen of him in the trailer, he appears more Zodiac Killer. We see him leaving coded messages and even sending a Halloween-themed greeting card similar to one, the one the real killer sent. There is even a mask the Riddler wears that is reminiscent of the one from the sketches of the Zodiac Killer. While we can see the parallels in design and how the character communicates, I think the similarities will end there. The Riddler hasn't been a killer in the majority of his previous appearances. The trailer shows us a Riddler who is going up against what he believes are lying, corrupt politicians. The killing would be a huge escalation for the character, but it would fit in with the OCPD. His inability to lie is because of his moral code. Then his strict adherence to the rules could lead him to go after those he sees as lying. And while he could just kill them outright, his compulsion to use clues and riddles dictate that he has to send the messages to the police and Batman. So where at first glance, this version might appear to be a huge departure from the characters we know it. It is just as likely that Reeves has completely embraced the psychology of the Riddler and is using it in a different and more extreme way. In the 73 years since the character was introduced, it's those stories that see the character as more than his gimmick or OCD that has propelled his popularity. He has been shaped by many hands into a very intelligent and troubled character who is often his own worst enemy, and one of the biggest threats Batman has ever faced. Of all his toys, it's Batman's mind that is most powerful weapon, and Thigma can counter that. He's no match in a fight, but in a battle of wits, Nigma has the potential to come out on top, if he doesn't sabotage himself again. And while the truth is stranger than fiction, the more reality you put into the fiction, the closer it becomes to the truth.